ಶ್ರುತಿ ಸ್ಮೃತಿ ಪುರಾಣ ಆಲಯ ಕರುಣಾಲಯ ನಮಿ ಭಗವತ್ ಪಾದ ಶಂಕರ ಲೋಕಶಂಕರ so in the vivek churamani we are now in the section where the manu maya kosha the mental shit is being described and as it has already been indicated that the mind alone is the cause of bondage and again mind alone is the cause of liberation the entire spiritual journey has to do with the mind it is the cause of our bondage again it is the same mind which is the cause of our liberation so this is the thing which has been described from the 178th to the 174th verse of the viveka churamani so we will start our discussion with the 170th verse 170th word verse what it is saying swapne arth shunye srijati swashaktiya bhoktradi vishvam mana eva sarvam tathaiva jagrati api na vishesha ತತ್ ಸರ್ವಂ ಏತತ್ ಮನಸ ವಿಜೃಂಭಣ ಸೊ ದ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಈಸ್ ನಥಿಂಗ್ ಬಟ್ ದ ಪ್ರೊಜೆಕ್ಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಫಾರ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ಭಗವತ್ಪಾದ ಶಂಕರಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಈಸ್ ರಿಸಾರ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಆನ್ ಅನಾಲಿಸಿಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಅನಾಲಿಸಿಸ್ ಈಸ್ ದಟ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಡ್ರೀಮ್ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ ಸ್ವಪ್ನೆ ಅರ್ಥ ಶೂನ್ಯ ಸೃಜತಿ ಸ್ವಶಕ್ತ ಇನ್ ದ ಡ್ರೀಮ್ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ ಮೈ ಆಲ್ ದ ಸೆನ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ಗನ್ಸ್ are not interacting with the world so the mind is as such artha shunya artha means the objects whenever i see an object a particular meaning that what it is uh, this is a table this is a chair this is a clock so this is a watch all these ideas are there in my mind but that idea pops up only when i'm interacting through the senses with the external world but in the dream state there is no such interaction the senses are not working so that's the meaning of artha shunya so without its interaction with the sense objects by the sense organs then the mind alone itself creates its own world by its own power swa shaktya so in the absence of the external objects in the dream the mind can create everything even including the enjoyer so in the dream when i am seeing i am experiencing all the dream objects so you will find even i have created myself the enjoyer as well the objects of enjoyment everything has mind has created so similarly now this is the uh, argument with which shankaracharya uh, bhagavad pada shankaracharya is saying the similarly in the waking state also there is no difference therefore all this this tathaiva jagrati api na vishesha this bhaktradi vishvam mana eva sarva the mind has created the bhukta 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 the one who is enjoyer as well as objects of enjoyment everything has the mind has created in a dream similarly in the state in the waking state tathaiva jagrati api na vishesha there is no difference now vishesha means there is no difference is the same thing even in this when i am awake the mind is creating tat sarvam etat manasa vijrimbhanam vijrimbhanam means to create to manifest this everything is being projected by the mind similarly in the waking state also so this is the argument which bhagavad pada shankaracharya is placing to say that the entire creation is actually the projection of the mind as we so many times have uh, discussed that what is there outside i never see what i see is merely the projection of the mind the external world acts as a stimuli 
but what it is what is there i never know the thing in itself is never known what i know are all the attributes of the thing that the example which we give again and again of a flower the red flower the redness that the flower apart from all those attributes i don't know what it is if i have to describe the fall flower i have to describe with all its attributes that its redness its smell its fragrance its texture the softness its shape all those things are the things which are the attributes those attributes are the projection of the mind as we say that even in psycho in our neurology what they say that it is the brain which is projecting the everything the brain the organ of the mind is projecting the color the shape the external world is acting as a stimuli the color doesn't directly is perceived by the mind as light falls on the retina its function stops there it doesn't enter our brain what goes to the brain is the nervous stimuli which has been generated after the light has touched the retina when it touches the retina a nerve impulse is generated and that is transmitted to the brain and when that particular frequency of nervous impulse reaches the brain the so called color perception center projects the redness and that's the redness which we see which has been projected by the mind so this is the thing which the mind is doing so what's the difference between waking state and in the dream state in the waking state yes there is an external stimuli which stimulates the particular uh brain center and the thing is projected but in the dream state what is happening there is no external stimulus there is automatically the same some the latent impressions which are in the mind the idea of redness which is already in the mind in the dream when i see the red flower exactly the same red flower what will be happening the same the same st- uh, projection happens without the stimuli so the same thing is happening so in both the cases in dream as well as in the waking state it is the mind which is the projecting the universe now there may be some doubt that the first objection may be raised that in the waking state what i perceive is also perceived by others but what i perceive in dream is not perceived by others when i wake up i say i have seen such and such in the dream the other person says well it is your dream but in the waking state when i say this is a red flower the other person says it's a red flower so we may say that what you say in the dream is imaginary what i see in in the waking state as i can have a consensus reality so it is real so very nicely you will find this has objections has been answered what they say that well we shouldn't we shouldn't forget that when in the dream if i see other animate things other persons in the dream so in the dream when i am seeing a red flower in the dream there is another person which is seeing the red flower for them they are seeing the same red flower in the dream when i am relating to some external object some other person is also relating to the same object so when i say that when i wake up and the other person doesn't relate to my dream the mistake which we are doing we are trying to relate the personality in the waking state with the object in the dream state so we have we forget that we have seen some persons even in the dream and in that dream they were of course correlating with the objects in the same way which i correlate when i am awake so what they say that the experiences are different but the mind is projecting the reality even in the dream state where i see various persons with me they are also interacting with the world which is seen in the dream in the same way as i am doing so that way again the the same reason remains valid that what i see in the dream state is a projection maybe it's a different type of projection from the waking state but it is also a projection and what i see in the waking state is also a projection of the mind it's all the mind which is projecting so again it may be objected that the dream experiences are contradicted by the experience of the waking state that when i wake up then i find it was a dream but the, with the same reason again with the same reason i can say that when i was dreaming the dream one was real 
I never thought that I am dreaming and the, what I see in the waking state that is real. When I am dreaming, that dream itself is real and it contradicts the waking state. And when I am awake, that again the wakeful state contradicts the dream state. Both are contradicting each other, but both are real when I am experiencing it. So that shows that what the mind projects, I take it as a reality for the time being. In the dream state, I take the dream world to be the real. That's why there's a nice uh, anecdote in the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, that a person, a, a farmer, uh, he had only one child. One day he went for his work, after hard work, when he returned, he found his wife is crying that the only child has died. But there was no reaction visible in the farmer. The farmer was just the usual person, as if nothing has happened. The wife was very much surprised. He told how heartless you are. The only child we had, we have lost, and still you have no feelings. And then the farmer told a very interesting thing, that yesterday night, in the dream I saw, that I have become the king, and I have seven princes. They're handsome and they're skilled in the art of war, in the art of administration. And then when I woke up, then I realized, oh, it's all dream. The seven children are gone. And now in the waking state, I find my one child has gone. Now for whom should I cry? For the seven children or for this one? So in the dream state, they were all real. They were as real as I am seeing the reality uh, of this present world in the waking state. So he's as if, he's just replying like a jnani. <coughs> he's that in the dream state they were real. This all the things I projected. So these con this experiences contradict each other. The very interesting thing that the experiences are contradicting, but the experiencer is the same. I never feel that the one who was experiencing all the things in the dream world is the different from the world from the one who is experiencing the phenomenal world in the waking state the experiences are different but the experiencer is the same so it is the experiencer that the self that's the thing that's not changing but the experiences are changing and that experiences are thereby the projection of the mind they are not the reality they are changing but the one who is experiencing, he is not changing. He is the same. So the experiencer is the same, but the experiences are contradicting each other. So again, that way they say that what I see in the dream is the projection of the mind, and what I see in the waking state also is the projection of the mind. And now again, at the last thing, again another objection may be there. It may be objected that the in the dream world, when the external world is as such not there, the latent impressions, the samskaras, the vasanas, they create the dream. That all my desires, latent desires, that's what pops up in the dream. That is unreal. But in the waking state, what I see is the objective reality. So here again, we will find uh, the scripture just ar argues this in a very nice way. They say, Yes, it is true that our latent impressions creates the dream world. What I see in the dream because of my samskaras, I take it real for the time being when I am dreaming. But in the wakeful state also the same thing happens. The world which I see is the product of my latent impressions. You say, how? Yeah, there are many ways to understand that. There's a very common example in Vedanta they give is of a stump. In the corner of a park, a tree has fallen in the storm, the stump is remaining and from a distance in the twilight hours, as per our vasanas, as per our mental bias, inclinations, we will find that the stump is being perceived differently by different person. Very nicely they say, a thief is running from the police, in the, his being scared of the police, he is trying to escape from the police and from a distance he sees the stump, sees the stump and thinks the stump to be the police. The police who is in search of the thief from a distance sees the stump as the thief. 
the child who was playing in the park now it's time to return home it's almost dark so he's in search of his mother most probably mother is waiting in some corner and from a distance the child sees the stump as the mother the mother who is waiting for the child sees the stump as the child a lover sees the stump as a beloved so isn't it our this biases which affects our vision so we we are taking this allegory from the vedanta but even in the modern world everywhere we will find that it is our desires which do create the reality you will find in a in a some game in the in a tournament when there is some a some turmoil within the game some players starts fighting with each other for some reason and it may turn out to be a chaos in the entire stadium or maybe there was there was some decision which one team thought was wrong and for that they were confronting with the referee and even even it will immediately found that the entire stadium the chaos has started the two supporters have started fighting and that's the time you have to go and interview them you ask them who is wrong you find both the supporters that supports of both the teams they say we are correct our team was correct the other side was wrong so they you find that when there an accident happens in the road and you try to collect the witnesses those who have seen it is a very interesting thing the police have found that never two witnesses are the same that how our mental bend actually really constructs the reality everywhere you will find very interesting thing you will find that some book has been co-authored the two persons have contributed now it it may be that they have contributed equally or it may be someone has contributed more someone has less but if you ask the co-authors that what's the percentage you contributed you invariably will found that the total contribution is more than 100% it is always more than 100% so what it speaks of our bias constructs the reality whenever there is a car accident someone has met a car accident a severe car accident and he has been injured he is in the hospital lying in the hospital bed severely injured and is on the process of treatment you go and interview him was it your fault no it was not my fault 90% cases as per your driving is concerned how will you rate it is it good you will find they will rate it very high as high as the professional drivers who are having the job of test driving they will just go on rating themselves to that level so what it speaks our biases our likings constructs the reality always because of our biases we never see the thing correctly that sri ramakrishna's common that example he gives again and again that why we never see the thing as it is we can never relate to the world correctly because of our biases he says the two chess players were playing and the third one was observing and it was found that the observers was always saying the correct moves they were desisting him don't say let us let us play but out of just enthusiasm he was again and again saying the correct move now everyone thought that this is the third person is a good player but now the role changed one of the players became the onlooker and the one who was an onlooker he started playing the moment he started playing he started making wrong steps this is example sri ramakrishna is why as our mind is full of bias the moment i am playing immediately my mind gets clouded with the expectation i have to win with a fear i shouldn't lose this has clouded the mind now i don't see the reality as it is in the chess board the onlooker is without bias he sees the thing as it is so what all these examples say that not only in dream even when i'm awake our vasanas our this uh, samskaras the impressions which are already stored in the mind is constantly creating the reality so you will find swami ji has given an example if you find that in abrahamic in special in islam when they speak of the heaven it's full of rivers water bodies because 
the religion originated in the desert it's full of water bodies and if, if you just ask a person uh, who is from the flood prone area he will find that his idea of his heaven will be totally different he will say no it's a very dry place they, they have rain but when, that it's not uh, that uh, it's a uh, scarce rain is there so that that we don't get flooded throughout the year so these concepts of our reality everything changes as per our likings and dislikings and that's the thing here also in this look in this verse also uh, we have to argue that way it is fact that yes our vasanas do create reality in the dream the same vasanas do create a reality in the waking state which is very much subjective which has nothing to do with the thing as it is we never see the thing as it is so that's the idea which we find has been spoken of in the 170th verse so thus if we analyze if we analyze thoroughly the waking state and the dreaming state critically what we find that we are bound to conclude that the universe of our experience is the projection of the mind so now the next verse what it is saying shushupti kale so now we have examined the waking state and the dream state there are only three states which we are going through in this life the waking state the dream state and the deep sleep state the dreamless sleep shushupti when you are not dreaming you are in deep sleep so that's being described in the 171st verse what is he saying shushupti kale manasi praline na eva asti kinchit sakal prasiddhe ato mana kalpitam eva punsa sansara etasya na vastuta asti that is the deep sleep in the dreamless sleep sushupti kale manasi praline eva the mind is totally has become what has what has the mind become it has got stilled the mind is not at all active and what do we find the creation has also vanished for me that i was in deep sleep i experienced nothing so what it says it is a mind when it is active that is projecting the universe when it is still the universe ceases to exist so shushupti kale manasi prane when the mind has still pralina as if it has uh, uh, temporarily gone to the state of pralaya disintegration it's not active na eva asti kinchit sakala prasiddha whatever i see nothing exist as sri ramakrishna says a king a powerful king everyone is so much uh, afraid of him because uh, they know that he is a, a person of extreme power he can harm a person he can kill a person so such a person even he is sleeping if anyone comes and spits on him he has no power nothing he can do his he becomes totally powerless because the entire world has fallen from him so all his power everything is related to only the waking state his wealth his power his everything is related to the waking state when he is in shushupti he is just like any other person the entire world has vanished for him he is that much only we can say nothing no other adjectives can be attributed to him all the experience has stopped that's the idea of kinchit sakal prasiddhe ato mana kalpita eva punsa so that's why this entire creation is the imagination of the mind kalpita is the creation of the mind sansara etasya na vastu this world doesn't exist as such so this is the idea which we find uh, which we indicated here that the a story which uh, we related long back uh, if you all recollect the story is uh, the story of aniruddha very interesting story in buddhism that aniruddha was buddha's cousin now he because of some meritorious acts in his previous birth was born in that in the birth as a cousin of buddha with the boon of satya sankalpa that whatever he desires that has to be fulfilled with that boon he was born he was satya sankalpa whatever he desires that's will be fulfilled now as a small child aniruddha was playing with his cousins now 
in the process of their game in the morning they came out from the palace with other royal children they were all playing their parents were of course busy with their uh, royal work administration or with the household work the mothers were busy with the household work and the children were all playing now it was the norm of the day when the children went out for playing the mother would pack a lunch box for them that yes when they are hungry they can have the food and as they were royal so this royal children so a servant always used to accompany them there was a servant who is to carry the lunch box and these children will be playing whenever the, they are hungry the servant is supposed to provide them with their lunch box now one day this aniruddha and the other children when they were playing they suddenly devised of a game which somehow is like gambling now they don't have anything they are the, the small child they don't have any as such uh, currency notes or any wealth so with what to gamble so the, they all planned that why not we have the lunch box whatever food is there with that we will gamble and then the game started and aniruddha started losing but he got so much engrossed in the game that the piles of bread that his mother has packed for him in the lunch box he took from the servant and he was betting on those breads and one by one all the breads he lost all were lost so now still he was willing to play he was so much engrossed he wanted to continue so he ordered the servant go my go back to my mother and ask her to again fill the lunch box with a pile of breads so the servant went back the mother thought most probably my child is quite hungry today he wants more bread so she again filled the lunch box with a pile of breads again aniruddha started playing again he was losing all the breads were gone and now by this time he was really hungry so now for the third time for the second time again he asked the servant go to my mother ask her to fill the lunch box with breads so this time again he goes now the mother realizes that my child cannot be eating so many breads must they must be they must have devised something some wrong doing is going on there some mischief thing they are doing so now the mother gave the empty lunch box back to the servant and told take it back to my child and say him no bread no bread enough no bread so now the servant was returning with the lunch box and now all the devas all the celestial beings they were concerned because aniruddha has been born with that boon that he is satya sankalpa whatever he wills immediately he has to be materialized he should get it so now he is in need of bread and he this servant is going with the lunch box empty lunch box so what the this devas the celestial beings did they conspicuously they the servant never knew somehow they managed to fill the lunch box with all celestial breads wonderful flavor they filled it and now the servant as he was instructed he went and gave the lunch box to aniruddha and said no bread now aniruddha opened the lunch box and found all those piles of celestial breads he started eating he have never tasted such nice bread he was really sati i mean it's not satiated he was having the, the urge to have more such celestial bread and now again he gave back this lunch box to his servant and asked him go back to my mother and ask her to fill it with no bread this no bread has become an entity for aniruddha because such nice bread he has never taken so this is the story in buddhism it's a very nice story what's the implication of it that what that this external world is giving us is the empty lunch box the external stimuli as we say that the red color of the flower is projected by the mind the smell the taste whatever we are doing is all projection of the mind and then what the external world is doing it is giving the empty lunch box and they are conspicuously fooled by the devas who are the devas <coughs> here the devas are the eyes the ears 
<coughs> the nose, the tongue, the skin. In Sanskrit, the word Deva came from Div Dhatu. Div. Div is the root from which the word Deva came. Div means to illumine. Thus, the sun is Divya. Div means to illumine. So these are the sense organs which illumines the world for me. So that's why they are also Devas. It's not only the celestial beings. These eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the skin. These are the Devas because they are illumining, illuminating the world for me. So these are the Devas. We shouldn't take these eyes, the external eyes as the Deva. The real eye is in the mind. These are just an apparatus. In Sanskrit they call Golaka. These are the Golakas, apparatus, through which the light just touches the thing and it gets converted into nerve current, which is reaching the real eye, the real sight center in the mind. So they are the Deva sitting there. So they fill the empty lunch box with all the celestial breads. This, this prapancha, this world of beauty. We stand in front of a mountain, we stand in front of the ocean, engrossed in the beauty. It's all the projection of the mind. In the night we look at the sky, at the galaxies, all the projection of the mind. Is it presenting something uh, which is not there? There is something. We are never, there. Vedanta never denies that there is not something. But we never know what it is really is. What is coming is the empty lunch box. The projection of the mind is the thing which appears to me as the reality. This, all the devas are filling them with the celestial bread. So in Shushupti, when the mind has stopped working, the external world falls off. There is no world for me. What is the Shushupti like? When I wake up, though there is no world for me, what is the interesting thing? When I wake up, I do know it is I who was in deep sleep. Do you ever feel, ever feel that I never, I know nothing? No, I know I was in deep sleep. So again, the question of experiencer is still there. Even in deep sleep, someone was experiencing that I am Shushupti. Otherwise, how would you know that I was in deep sleep? So the same experiencer who is experiencing the dreams is the same experiencer who is also experiencing the state of Shushupti is the same experiencer who is again experiencing the waking state. He alone is the one who is real, not changing, always there as a witness. Other things are changing. Sometimes the phenomenal world totally collapses and sometimes in the dream state, whatever experiences we are having is contradicting the experiences of the waking state, but they are both the projections of the mind. When the mind ceases, nothing is there. We can understand these three states with an example, the three states and behind which one experience is there, with an example of the school where all the classrooms are fixed with surveillance camera. The surveillance camera is there and they are all fixed to the monitor in the principal's office where the principal can see what's going on in the classrooms. Now what he sees in the classroom, that in a classroom, when the teacher is there, the students are all obedient, sitting silently, maintaining the discipline. The class is going on. It is like the waking state. What happens? Where, that in the present uh, modern neurology, they say that in the waking state, the hindbrain as well as the forebrain, both are active. The forebrain is like the teacher. It constantly monitors over this, all the impressions which are stored in the hindbrain. We are just giving a very simplified view of the brain working. It is a very intricated thing, just to have an understanding. So this forebrain is monitoring the hindbrain and that is why our experiences somehow we find is appears to be all uh, congruous. This are, all are coinciding with each other. In the dream state what happens? The class is over, the teacher has left the classroom and now the student starts jumping, frolicking, having fun. So there is a chaos in the classroom. The, all those who are supposed to sit in the designated places are no more sitting there. They are found in each other's 
uh, company jumping from one bench to the other, all these things are going on. That's the dream state. To give an example, in the waking state, I know what is gold, I know what is mountain. It's an example uh, which we will find in some context in our scripture. That the, there is a mountain and this is gold. I know these two are total separate entity. In the dream state, I can see a mountain made of gold. What has happened? That no one is there to monitor the sub impressions of the subconscious mind. So the idea of gold jumble, jumbles up with the idea of the mountain to make me see the golden mountain. So the teacher is not there. All the ideas are getting mixed up without any monitoring. And that's what is the state of dream. And what's the state of Shushupti? The class is over, the school final bell has rang, the so students left, the teachers left, the classroom is empty, no activity is going on. But the principal, through the surveillance camera, is still watching the empty classroom. He's still watching, the witness is still there, with that he's experiencing nothing. So that's the idea of Shushupti, when the mind has become inactive, it has pralina, all the activities have stopped, then the entire reality, the creation has collapsed. So that again is the proof that mind alone creates the so-called reality. It, there, that there is no such absolute reality which we can know. What we know is the consensus reality. That my mind is hallucinating in the same way as your mind and that's why we all vote as like a voting as the majority that yes, this is the reality. You will find that the, some do have mental aberrations and we say he is defective. But nowadays even in uh, modern neurology they never say that he is having some problem or disease. What they say he is a bit different. That his mind is also hallucinating in a different way. That you find that there is a color blind. That yes that the colors which we project for a particular thing, he is not doing that same way. We say him colorblind, but actually he is a bit different from us. He is minority and that's why he is defective. And those who all hallucinate in the same way, we say yes, as we are the majority, we, are, we have the numbers, so that's the reality which we decide. But actually, everyone is hallucinating, projecting the universe through the mind. So that's the idea which is being again spoken of in the 171st verse. Even in the Yoga Sutra, we find a very nice uh, definition of Shushupti. What they say? What is the state of Shushupti? The Nidra, Abhava, Pratyaya, Alambana, Vritti, Nidra. This each and every word is having a very specific meaning. That in Yoga Sutra, they define Vritti and Pratyaya as two different things. Vritti is the mental wave, and Pratyaya is the content of the mental wave. That my mind is constantly breaking into waves. When I'm seeing the some something outside, that is being reflected on the wave, and what is being reflected, that's what I perceive. So when I'm seeing the flower, the flower is reflected in the mental wave, I say this is flower. So this content of the wave is the Pratyaya. And the, the very nicely Yoga Sutra has said that even in deep sleep, the Vritti doesn't stop, it is still there. Mind, even in neurology we will find, even in sleep, if you are scanning the brain, activity is going on. And that was known thousands of years back. This vritti only stops in samadhi, not even in sleep. Only in samadhi it stops. In, even in deep sleep these vrittis are there, but there is no content. The vrittis have no pratyaya, the contents is not there. And that is the state of nidra. So what the external world is nothing but the pratyas. The contents of the waves creates this universe. When there is no pratyaya, there is no external world. So the external world is nothing but these pratyas. So now uh, Bhagavad Pada Shankaracharya is giving a very nice example to just uh, illustrate what has been stated in the 170th and 171st verse. What it is saying? This vayuna aniyate megha punah tenaiva niyate manasa kalpyate bandho moksha tenaiva kalpate so the sky is clear and suddenly we find the wind brings some cloud 
and the clear cloud gets clouded it becomes dark and again after some time the wind same wind comes and takes away the cloud and again the sky clears up and that's how our mind is clouding our vision with the ignorance and again it is clearing that cloud of ignorance to again go beyond the mind and relate to the reality by get, getting rid of the cloud of ignorance so that's what uh, bhagavad pada shankaracharya is illustrating in the 172nd verse the vayuna aniyate megha the clouds are brought in by the brain aniyate punah tenaiva niyate again they take the, take it away they are driven away again by the wind similarly manasa kalpate bandha similarly the man's bondage is caused by the mind moksha tenaiva kalpate the liberation to is caused by the mind so the next verse will say that how the mind causes this bondage and how it liberates us that it gives an example a general example a, a, a simile with the help of cloud now the actual uh, specific reason for the cause of bondage and again the cause of liberation which for which the mind is the cause is being stated in the 173rd verse what it is saying dehadi sarva vishaye parikalpya ragam badnati tena purusham pashuvat gunena vairasyam atra vishavat suvidhaya paschat enam vimochayati tat mana eva bandhat dehadi sarva vishaye parikalpya ragam so this ragam is attachment by producing attachment to the objects like the body dehadi sarva vishaye parikalpya raga by creating parikalpya means by creating attachment to this body and other things which are related to the body this badnadi the mind just binds us the mind keeps us on the bondage just the way we chain a animal we will chain an animal to domesticate it but similarly the mind has as if domesticated us kept us under bondage by these various chains so that's the example which bhagavad pada shankaracha is giving vadnati tena purusham pashuvat gunena with all the gunas that what these gunas are that we will describe the sattva rajatama what it actually means that we will try to understand with all these gunas it has created several ropes these three gunas have intertwined to create several ropes to bind us and that's the cause of our bondage just the, similarly the way we bind the animals with the ropes similarly the mind has as if bound us with all these ropes made up of sattva rajas and tamas and then vairasya matra vishavat and then when the detachment comes vairasya is a detachment and i realize them to be visha that all the apparent objects of my attachment all the objects which of uh, which are responsible for my worldly attachments for that i have developed vairasya they have developed vairagya detachment how it has developed by knowing them to be poison vishavat suvidhaya paschat so this letter the same mind creates aversion paschat means first it has the same mind has deluded me through attachment and paschat after that when i have gone through all the experiences at last the same mind now will bring detachment and to that i will start renouncing them just like poison and then that will result in liberation enam vimochayati tat mana eva bandha the same mind which caused the bondage that will liberate me now what actually you will find these examples are so appropriate yes it's really like rope we are being bound like a cattle by the mind how these ropes are formed in yoga in vedanta they speak that from because of avidya because of ignorance comes this the ego develops avidya asmita raga dvesha abhinivesha these are the pancha klesha because of a, a, a ignorance comes asmita the ego develops and from the ego comes raga attachment dvesha 
hatred, abhinivesha, fear, fear of death. All this comes from the first thing is avidya. What it is speaking of? That when the conscious principle, because of ignorance, gets associated with the psychophysical existence, it creates that ego, asmita. I forgot my real nature. I take this body-mind complex to my real nature and try to realize the eternity which is echoing from within. The self is after all eternal. That is the thing which is echoing. I try to realize that eternity through the body-mind complex. And from that, that our, what do you say, that worldly existence have started. That example which we give again and again, a small microbe, which is not even visible through the naked eye, you are seeing through a microscope, they are all moving randomly, you put a drop of nutrient, they gather direction, they start moving towards it. Instead of nutrient, if you give some toxin, they run away from it, they move away from it. What has happened? That the moment that the microbe body, the self has got identified with the microbe body, it thinks I am this microbe body, and now it tries to realize its eternity which is echoing from within through that micro body. So whatever is favorable for its existence, it gets drawn towards it, raga. Whatever is not favorable for its existence, it gets, becomes, gets aversive towards it. It runs away from it. That speaks of fight and flight response. Either I hate it and try to get rid of it, and if I don't have the power to get rid of it, I myself run away from it. Abhinivesha, fight and flight response. So all this is coming because of ignorance I have identified with this body. So now you will find that with, see, when I gave some nutrient, it was drawn towards it. So as per the external circumstances, a particular stimuli response conditioning starts working. That if there is a nutrient, I am drawn towards it. And that creates a particular mental module. That whenever such and such external circumstance is there, I will get drawn. When such, when other external circumstance is there, like toxin, I run away from it. There's another mental module. So in the process of evolution, because of all these external stimuli, we created innumerable such mental modules. Innumerable such mental models have been created. They're all in my mind. At a particular situation, I think I am the doer. I decide what I'm going to do. But even in the modern neurology, psychology, they say no. Actually, it's, we never decide what we are going, that what I am going to do. I am not the karta. In a particular circumstance in which I am exposed, and out of those innumerable mental modules, one module will get activated. As per the circumstances, it has nothing to do with my decision. The module that gets activated, it has its own particular stimuli response conditioning and you are bound to respond as per the stimuli response conditioning. But at the same time, mind will fool you by making you think you have taken the decision. The left brain, the propaganda brain, it's, it, makes a, it makes a wild propaganda. It is you who are the doer. It, makes, it tries to make you believe as well as the world believe that it is you who have decided. If you say, is it really so? There are thousands of examples. There's a book uh, in psychology that's called Why Everyone Else is a Hypocrite. Even because we don't understand our own mind. We'll find it is constantly being acted by those, uh, partic uh, a particular external stimuli activates a particular mental module and that the decision, the response is fixed and we are bound to act and it makes us feel that I am acting. That example which we give again and again that a, a group of students were going for an excursion. The, uh, it was planned in such a way that they will halt, that, uh, that it was from a university, that excursion was uh, arranged from a university where the students were allowed to go with their family. It was done with a purpose. Uh, what's the purpose? That we will try to find out that what's the purpose. Now this entire group were supposed to go to some destination but the trip was planned in such a way that in the evening they will get down in a small village town 
and they will spend the night there and the next day morning again they will catch the train to go to the exact destination now in the evening when they got down from the train now the question is they ha all has to be allocated some uh, place of boarding some hotel but there was no sufficient hotel in the center of the town the small town some have to go to some remote place a bit remote inside now those who were organizing this trip they had something some plan in their mind they thought that we will never force anyone that to decide where to stay either in the center of the town or in the remote place they themselves will take the decision and we will find nicely uh, the, the allotment has been done as per their choice how when they got down from the train they were taken to a uh, mall where there were two three movies were going on there is a uh, it uh, you know, this uh, what you say this uh, a movie theater a movie complex where two three movies were going on and some went to the one of the movie which was a horror movie and others went to a movie which was a family adventure movie when they came out there was found a wonderful thing those who went for the horror movie they were asked to choose the hotel they all chose in the center of the town in the heart of the town and those who went for the family adventure movie they all chose the hotel in the remote place and ni nicely the work was done there was no question of forcing the allotment they themselves chose how it happened now those who went for the horror movie they were in the protection mode the protection module got self protection module got activated you will find in the entire process of evolution what happens when a predator attacks a herd of cattle all the cattle when they are running they always try to be together because they know very well if i somehow get separated from the herd the entire attention will be on me and it's gone i am i can no way escape because he has fixed his attention the predator has fixed his attention on me if i am in the herd probability of escaping is more maybe that his attention is not on me because i am with the herd so whenever we are in protection mode we always try to be together but whenever we are with our family that is the kith and kith module the separate module we always want to be isolated from others so now you will find that they felt they have decided which hotel they want to stay but it was the mental module which got activated by the movie which we were saying that have actually decided so what it says aren't we bound with rope just the way we bind the cattle uh, uh, with a rope in a post similarly all these mental modules have kept us bound just like an animal and what who is doing this is a trick of the mind it was making us feel i am the doer but actually we are all bound by all these innumerable mental modules which are activated as per the external stimuli stimuli making us act making us act in a particular way we are helpless but at the same time it makes us feel that oh i am deciding so that's the ignorance and that's what is being saying deha adi sarva vishaya parikalpa ragam it is this attachment from our body to all the things which is extended along with the body that is the cause of our bondage the mind has created and it has bound how pashuvat with these three gunas what are the three gunas the stimuli is the sattva guna when i perceive something that immediately that all the knowledge is in my mind the stimuli activates that knowledge so we say satya is knowledge so this stimuli is sattva the reaction that comes out of is the rajas activity and what is tamas as long as no stimuli is activating the mind all the impressions all the latent impressions are there in the mind dormant in dark that is the state of tamas so these are the three things which has created that rope sattva rajatama stimuli response of this innumerable mental modules that has created these ropes with which i am bound and this is all the trick of the mind and then vairasyam when at last the detachment comes vairasyam atra vishavat suvidhaya paschat now as we were giving that example that that even in a small microbe someone within is saying your infinite 
you are always satiated but i find that as i'm identified with the body i don't realize that the body do disintegrate it is always having khut pipasha hunger and thirst how can it always be satiated now that eco by which i have been uh, kept in ignorance i have been deluded i try to realize that eco through the body mind complex and that has resulted in the entire biological evolution in vedanta we never deny the biological evolution it has happened we don't believe in design that god has as if designed all the beings as it is no the evolution did happen out of ignorance out of ignorance the moment that ignorance is dawned in from that the constant attempt to realize the eternity and fulfillment through this life we are trying to evolve and that has how it has done, has happened a single cell conglomerated with the other cells so that it can fight with the external factors of the nature in a better way so that it can realize more and more its eternity and that's how we have evolved as a human being with this complex structure with so much of division of labor so many cells have conglomerated to much better equip but still can we have can have we realized eternity no the entire civilization at last you will find is nothing but is in search of that eternity can they ever find no the biological evolution can go on but it can never find that eternity in this physical plane at last as a human being we have that specific called quality which no other creature have that is the distinction that makes us human that we can realize oh it is ignorance i am already fulfilled it is because of my wrong association i was feeling i am not fulfilled i am not eternal i want to realize the eternity and the fulfillment through the physical plane which is not required i am already that i was taking the reflection to be the real and that's ignorance has resulted in all the evolution but when i realize that i am already that then that vairagya comes why all this attempt futile attempt i can never realize the perfection in this world of imperfection i can never realize the permanent in this world of flow impossible then this detachment comes that's the vairasyam and then this, when it comes only after enjoyment after all these experiences at last this comes in the gospel sri ramakrishna very nicely is saying that god himself does all the work at last he makes us do little sadhana to give us a feeling it is through our spiritual sadhana we are going to liberation no the entire process of evolution has been planned by the divine in such a way that where unconsciously we were trying to experience the eternity through the physical plane it was it was total the from the microbe to the human being whatever is happening is a spiritual growth unless we go through that there cannot be any liberation as a human being when that consciousness dawns oh it is something which is a product of ignorance now consciously i start my spiritual journey and i think it is with this practice i am going to get liberation it is just a very small portion the most of this work has been devised by god through the mind it has been done and now that's why sri ramakrishna these words of god, god in the gospel are so interesting he says that it is god who does the most of the work at just at last he makes us do a little sadhana to make us feel as if i am doing nothing it is his plan so this is vairasya comes in the apex of the evolution when as a human being at last this vairagya when i realize that i can never realize the eternity through this ephemeral world this detachment comes and then that with that comes this what this sattva guna you see constantly i was reacting to the external stimuli now i create a new mental module all the mental modules were having stimuli response conditioning for a particular stimuli i react now i design a new once i developed the vairagya what is the new mental module which constantly thinks i am not the body not the mind not the senses i am the atman i am the self aham brahmasmi soham so here for this thought there is no reaction it is a constant pure satvik thought what it is doing it is hammering the ego now you will find that so many ropes has been created all are fixed to the ego ego is the hub 
of which all these various mental modules are like the spikes. If one spike breaks, still the personality, the will of the personality is intact because there are so many other spikes to keep it intact. But if I can remove the hub of the will, the entire will collapses. All the spikes and the will at, at one go collapses. So this new mental module, which is constantly contemplating on the fact, I am not the body, not the mind, not the senses. Shivoham, Shivoham, I am the self. Aham Brahmasmi. That's the thing which is hammering the ego. And when it succeeds in getting rid of the ego, the entire will of our personality collapses in one go, in a flash it happens. That renunciation doesn't happen little by little. In a go it happens. Entire thing falls off. Entire texture of the mind falls off, rendering us freedom. The prism of the mind falls off. The spectrum of the white light <coughs> passing through the vism, that also collapses and makes me identified with the self. I again become one with the self. So it is the same mind. By creating the same mind with that innumerable default mental model was already there. Now as a human being, when that realization dawns that I am already that perfect, then the detachment comes. And then this, with this new design module, you again go to the liberation. So it is the same mind which was kept you bound in this physical body. Again through Vairagya, it takes you again into the liberation. So that's what has been spoken of in the 173rd verse. And the, in, the Guru concludes the discussion on this bondage and liberation in the 174th verse by what he's saying, Tasmat manah karanasya janto vandhasya mokshasya cha vidhane. So thus, mind is the cause of both the bondage and liberation. Vandasya hetu malina rajaguna. There's all those default mental modules which were having a particular stimuli and particular response. That speaks of the rajaguna. You're responding. They were the cause of the bondage. Mokshasya shuddha viraja tasmakam. And the shuddha, that viraja, that from the renunciation that the thought came which has no reaction. It is a pure thought. That is a sattva. That aham brahmasmi. I am the Brahman, I am not the body, not the mind, not the senses. I am the absolute reality. This thought process is the pure Shuddha. That at last results in the Moksha. It is the same mind, a new mental module, a design mental module that at last results in the liberation. So with that, the discussion on the cause of bondage and the liberation, the mind, which is the both the cause of the bondage and the liberation, as has been highlighted by the Guru, from the 170th verse, it concludes in the 174th verse. So with this, we stop our discussion. Thank you all. Namaskars.